You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Why take one vacation with the family when you could take all of them? With Royal Caribbean, you don't just go to the beach. You visit a private island and race down the tallest water slide in North America. You don't just go for a road trip. You ATV and zip line through the jungle. You don't just go somewhere new. You rappel down waterfalls and discover ancient temples. Because this isn't just any vacation. This is all the vacations. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry, Bahamas. It's only a kick. A jump. A block. It's only a serve. It's only a tackle. A run. It's only for the fans. After all, it's only pressure. You got this. Adidas. You, you feel this, this nervousness on the phone there? Sir, I've been trying to make an urgent phone call up there. Well, I don't think it's something I want to do on an overseas phone. You got to make some phone calls. Hang up the phone. Prank call. Prank call. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to Packernet After Dark. This is the call-in show of the Packernet Podcast Network. If you'd like to call in, if you'd like to participate in the show, please feel free to do so. The phone number here is 608-501-0718. New callers go directly to the front of the line. We don't have any new callers today, so let's see what Dan's talking about. Hey, Ryan. This is Dan from Indy. Hey. It is 11.30. On Tuesday, I had some time to marinate and think about what we witnessed. And, uh, yeah, I, I mean, obviously it was not a good game, but I, I just, I don't know. I think I think LaFleur just needs to kiss a bit, keep it simple, stupid, like, all the passes that I, I felt like I saw were between zero and five yards or 30 plus. There was no like long short passes to intermediate short passes, you know what I mean? Like, have you heard of a slant before LaFleur or maybe a curl route or I don't know? Like, I, I missed the plays from last year where, like, Watson was screaming across the field, where even, in, like, in zone, he's coming open several times, going through each area. Or I'm not seeing any of that. And then the the lack of pass attempts to Romeo Dobbs and Jaden Reed or the lack of scheme uh, uh, getting them open, I just the, – the offense was – Way too clunky, and I'm not trying to make excuses for Jordan Lowe because he threw three interceptions yesterday. He did, not the offense. He did, but there, it, it, I, it's hard for anybody to get into a, a groove when your play calling is as clunky as what what we've been watching. Like I love the fact that we started running the ball more, but the first five plays running, like. It was either run, 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 or pass, 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 pass. Like, I just, there's, no, there's no identity here. I, I just, I don't, the, the talent's there. I don't, I like, do the coaches understand how much talent we have? How about we just let these guys cook versus, hmm, let's, let's keep following what's going on in my head, even though what's going on in my head is changing every five f***ing minutes. Sorry for cursing. And Joe Barry, we we all know the situation. He just there's no aggressiveness there either. Like death by a thousand cuts is what we're getting here. There's not a big old f***ing blow. Or again, sorry. There's not a big blow to us or anything like that. But the Devonte Adams goal line pass, for example. All of our guys, you know, they're, they're, they're all five to seven yards back. And 
three minute bug got him. So look, I, again, I, I don't want to be repetitive because I feel like all the calls are kind of saying similar things and I kind of have a similar response. I did just finish the second part of the game. So, and obviously again, the, we're still on Tuesday's calls and um, I have now, you know, the, the the final podcast is getting released on Sunday. So that's that's partially on me for not getting this out sooner, not watching the game back soon enough. But um, I, I do not have a problem with the play calling. I mean, to specifically address some of the things you mentioned as far as the run, 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 run. When we were doing run, 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 it was working. Um, you know, the, the time we got a touchdown was, I think, like six runs in a row. It was like run, two passes, and then six runs for a touchdown. So that wasn't necessarily an option as far as the every pass is either short or intermediate i mean we've got to remember not everything that happens was the design right like an incomplete pass wasn't designed to be an incomplete pass a short pass isn't necessarily designed to be a short pass some of them were and many of those were successful um but there are also times when there are slant routes there are curl routes in fact we completed a few of them the the drop by musgrave was a curl route and there was also samori turi who was wide open on a curl on the other side um we we ran lots of different things jordan wasn't throwing it or you know whatever the case was i mean there, there were many times guys were open and they didn't get the ball i mean i i didn't actually count it but there were maybe three times where i looked and i was like yeah this this play just isn't gonna work um aside from that there was there were options almost every passing play so I, I, I don't have a problem with the scheme. I have a problem with the results. You know, the results looked bad and the offense did look clunky, but it, it you know, again, and this is this is the issue I have with judging play calling without being able to see the plays. Right? I mean, it, it, it feels like the play calling is bad. I will grant you that, right? I'm even watching it going, how is nobody open? Why does it feel like nobody's open? Because Jordan's dropping in the pocket, he's not throwing the ball. But I'm telling you, the majority of the time, there were options. Now, some of the time when there were open guys, there was pressure, which, again, is not a scheme issue. That's an offensive line issue, right? But I just, I'm, I'm just telling you, I do not have a problem with what I saw schematically. I think our offensive play callers, Matt LaFleur whooped the crap out of their defensive coordinator. I mean, very rarely were our guys just covered up. It did happen a couple times, which you would expect that to happen a couple times where, you know, they call the right call at the right time. But especially the passing concepts, there is always someone open. And um, you can, I mean, even as you go through it, and, and again, listen to the podcast, you can hear me kind of describe it. You can tell they're doing things to kind of get things into a rhythm. The run game, they're stealing yards. In the passing game, they're doing things to steal yards just to get easy completions to try to get some momentum. You know, uh, an immediate quick pass to Musgrave that goes for eight yards. Like, we got some momentum. We got a short field. I mean, we, so many times we just got these quick, easy passes and everything's going great and something goes wrong. And I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, and I'm not saying I'm the be all, end all, and my opinion is 100% correct. I'm sure other people can go back and watch it and be upset with the play calling. I am not upset. I think if I, the, the bot here, here's the bottom line. And I think this is true. You could probably say the same thing with Joe Barry too, if you wanted to. And I, I'm not saying this is the case. I'm just saying this is the same standard that I would want to apply. If people did their job, would it be good enough or not? If, if the offensive line blocked and Jordan Love threw to the right guy on time and that person caught the pass, would we, what, I, I think we win this game 35 to 14. And listen, I've seen it before. I, I remember back in the Aaron Rodgers, especially Aaron Rodgers, Mike McCarthy days where there, there just seemed like there was never anywhere to go and nobody was ever open. I don't think we had the right scheme. So, you know, my apologies to Kurt Benkert, who uh, certainly is not a fan of Matt LaFleur and says he has an outdated scheme and maybe there's some truth to that, but I, I don't think there was any issue with the play calling. I really don't. And, and again, if you want to go back and watch it, if you have access to the All-22 and you want to go back and watch it and, and dispute what I'm saying, please feel free to do so. But if you're asking me, I, I just don't have an issue with it, which is a good thing. I mean, it's, listen, this is, a, this is a, I feel better about our team after having watched it. I feel worse about our offensive line, and I'm furious at Elton Jenkins because I, 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 I don't know how he got like an average grade in this game. I, every single time something went wrong, I'm looking at him like, what are you doing? I guess he did enough good to out, you know, out do the bad, I guess, and I only noticed the bad. But man, oh man, that was frustrating watching him. But I mean, I I really have come back to the place where you know I think I think listen, Jordan was bad, and it wasn't just the interceptions; he was bad. But I do think 
and and you know, listen, you need to be able to play better under pressure. But but at the same time, I do think if the pressure improves, if the, excuse me, if the offensive line improves, I think Jordan will improve. And if Jordan improves, the entire offense improves. And it does start with the offensive line. And I don't want to believe that we have to replace this entire offensive line. But if that's what we have to do, then that's what we have to do. I don't, you know, because we 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 can't run the ball, we can't run block, we can't pass because there's suddenly all this, you know, the last couple of weeks pressure galore. But if we have an offense, I mean. Having watched that game, I believe if we had an offensive line that blocked for Jordan better, and we had an offensive line that could run block, and we had you know Aaron Jones, a better running back, I think there's a good chance we have a pretty solid offense. Now, it still makes me nervous that Jordan needs to feel very comfortable in a game, otherwise you're screwed. That's not great. But that is to say, if the offensive line can freaking wake up, I think there are still better days ahead. I don't have an answer on Jordan. I'm not out on Jordan. I think he does a lot of good things. I'm very nervous about a lot of things that I still have not seen progress on. Again, my issue, deep passing and under pressure and now accuracy, none of those three things have been resolved. But again, I I do feel better. And I also feel really good as maybe the only Packer fan in all of Packers fandom right now that's like, all right, dude, we got our we got our coach. We're good. We got a play caller. We just need better guys that can execute and I, and I like our receivers I think they were open if they had gotten the ball they would make plays many of them did yes they dropped a couple passes I get that that's not good but as I said in the um, podcast for tomorrow you know Romeo Dobbs dropped a pass I can't blame him for his one mistake when I've chewed out Jordan Love and Elton Jenkins and Rasheed Walker 17 freaking times up to this point so anyways A.A. Ron what's up what's up Ryan it's A.A. Ron from Eau Claire um <clears throat> So I'm processing the game from yet last night, and I'm kind of teetering between a couple of different possibilities um, for what the uh, future could hold. Sure. One being that Jordan Love is just uh, not – just has too many flaws to overcome to um, continue to be the NFL quarterback that we want him to be. Um. Yeah, uh, again, I, I agree to a, to a point. I mean, the, the issues are right now, I'm not going to say he can't overcome them. I hope he can. If he can't, then, then it's, we have an answer. Um, but he, he does have quite a bit to overcome. They're pretty big hurdles, and he has to overcome them or else he's not going to thrive or, or make it in the NFL. I, again, I haven't given up on him. But yeah, there there is definitely no question in my mind if he doesn't overcome these hurdles, he's he's not the guy. So fingers crossed. And again, I, I we can to some degree blame the offensive line, but at the other on the on the other hand, if this is is you know one sack in this game, to be clear, if this is how much things unravel because the pressure jumped up a little bit. Um, as compared to like a normal rate of 20, 25% pressure, he's facing 30% pressure. Suddenly things just go to zero. Um, that's not great either. So, um, I wouldn't say that it, he has too many flaws to overcome, but it, it certainly is concerning. And, and as I said, I don't think there's, there's much time. A lot of people seem to think that there is a lot of time. Um, I know again, Gutekunst said we'll know who he is by midseason. If they're holding to that, then he has very little time if they're going to give him to the end of the year, which, I mean, they're not going to replace him, but um, he has until the end of the year. Maybe they're going to give him another year no matter what, but I, I would definitively say by the end of the year, you have to show progress in these areas or it's it's a concern. The other is that he just needs to continue to improve or um watch the film of how he played and, and make adjustments and that maybe all this is is uh, just figuring out a new system, figuring out a new way of doing things. Obviously, hard to know. We just have to take it week to week. Yeah. But um, I, I think what's tricky about it is that the flashes of potential have been so exciting. And yeah. then, as you have mentioned, it's it's very Jekyll and Hyde, you know, it's either like, wow, what an incredible, you know, drive that was, what an incredible touchdown throw, what a good decision making, all this stuff. Um, and then in another situation, it's like, guys wide open, why can't you just hit him? Right. Um, 
So I don't really know which side I particularly am leaning on. I mean, I tend to be optimistic, so I've, I always want to lean towards he's still got a, a chance to be good. Um, I think he does. I mean, I just, but, you know, is, is he just going to be another Jameis Winston? Kind of a gunslinger who yeah, it's not a bad talented, got a great arm. Comparison, actually. Um, Likes to sling it down the field, lots of interceptions, lots of exciting things, but also, like, he's too reckless to to actually get you very far. I mean, that's that's not a terrible comparison. I mean, I hate to use that comp because Jameis is a little a little crazy, I think, but um, still, I mean, as a player, it, it kind of fits. But ultimately is uh, kind of erratic and doesn't have the super consistency that you want. Um I'm really rooting for him because I love his character, I love his yes. backstory, I love yep. his approach to the game and his leadership and all that stuff. Um, you know, I, I like him as a person, so I hope that he can he can pull it together uh, and, and continue to tighten up some of the things, whatever it is that's uh, that's not functioning properly in this offense. Um, uh, you know, maybe it's a Matt Lafleur. Thing. Maybe it's just kind of everything. I don't know. I, sometimes when things go wrong in life, you don't know exactly where to look. It's just kind of so you have to figure it out. So, anyways, go back, go. Yeah, you know, as I watch, and it's unfortunate because I felt like Jordan was maybe this guy. I felt like Jordan was exactly what we needed. Where at, at worst he could be a game manager, you know. And as long as Matt Lafleur can call a good game and get guys open, all we need is a guy that can stand in the pocket, make the good decisions, and make accurate throws. And then it was like, well, the accuracy was missing. It's like, well, that sucks, but usually it's there, and it's just kind of deep passes, and maybe he can work that out. But then, like, the decision-making is going away, and he's not throwing to the open guys and all that. And I don't like the fact that right now I'm looking at it going, man, I feel like with with a game manager we could have a really good offense, and we don't have that right now. Like, if I, if I could describe a guy that I think would be a good quarterback, obviously there's elite quarterbacks that can thrive in any situation, but find me a guy that is comfortable under pressure, that, that doesn't, you're never going to see him sweat. That is, you know, I mean, obviously if you're sacked, there's nothing you can do, but somebody that when you're not, you can keep your eyes downfield, you can keep your composure, play within structure, find the open guy, throw an accurate pass. I'm not looking for, for the, the Pat Mahomes stuff. I mean, it's great. You know, the the Lamar Jackson, Justin Fields, like, if you can do that, cool. If you can take off running, if you can throw the sidearm behind the back, eyes closed, no look, like, you, you can you can do some special stuff, and you're going to get yourself out of sticky situations. You make those passes that only 2% of quarterbacks can make, whereas, you know, you know the, the game managers, they, they wouldn't have made it in that situation. They wouldn't have made that perfect pass. But I I genuinely just think if if we could you know again we do need a run game on top of everything but but just I I really think a game manager kind of takes this team pretty far just an accurate game manager and what we've seen from Jordan Love has been less than that recently and I don't like that it's like if if Jordan could just get up to the level of game manager we'll be okay I really don't like that but that's kind of where I'm at right now Okay so I just heard uh a stat about Green Bay regarding uh, points for the first half that they score, uh, where do they rank, and it's five plus points in the first half, they rank 29th. In the second half, it's 19.3 points in the second half, that ranking, Bueller, Bueller, number one. So what I'm struggling to understand is after five games, we see them start out very slow. That's obvious. Second half, they make some comebacks. Maybe some of the points are in the very minute of garbage time, but um, clearly second half, they, they're clicking a lot better. So I don't know what kind of adjustments, if any, that's really uh, – the reason for it, but defensively, I'm kind of curious, Ryan. It does seem like in the first half, our defense is coming out fast and hot because I'm sure, I, I, I mean, starting off like with Kenny Clark, you know, comes out quick and then he disappears in the second half. 
Um, it seems like, you know, against Detroit, we get a, a interception like right off the bat. So uh, I'm just kind of curious if you're able to put together this puzzle of, um, you know, what kind of turnovers are we looking at for the defense in the first half versus the second half? And is this really a tale of two cities where the offense sucks the first half and puts too much on our defense and wears them out to the point where they come out and they finally are hitting the offense is hitting on plays in the second half, but our defense is just already gassed from long possessions and stuff because neither one of these uh, sides of the ball can seem to put together a complete game. And if they did, I think they would actually be good. But because they're inconsistent and because they miss opportunities, offense is good one half, the defense is good the other half. And just puts them behind the eight ball too much. It, it just, um, my mind's boggled at how they can be number one in the second half. Um, for as much awful, awful plays that we have witnessed so far this year. It just, and, and these teams have not been good except for Detroit. None of these teams are really that good. And yet here we are. Well, and, and, you know, not to make a, a bad situation worse, but we're only number one in the second half really because of a game or two. We, we, we're not number one in the second half the last couple of weeks. I mean, if, if you just go one game at a time, we scored 28 points in the second half against Chicago. So that obviously skews things. Uh, we scored 18 the next week. And then against uh, Detroit, we scored 17 in the second half. And then this past week was 10. So 28, like 18, 17, 10. So, you know, it, it, it really is a lot like everything else. Like with Jordan Love, it's like, man, he's, he's really good except these couple things. Or, or even, you know, if you look at Jordan Love with the, the CPOE versus EPA, EPA is through the roof, CPOE is through the floor. And it's like, well, which one's going to budge? Same thing here, where it's like, well, they're really good in the second half. They just get off to a slow start. And if we could just pick it up in the first half, and instead we're not picking it up in the first half, but we are taking it down in the second half. We scored three points in the first half. So that's pretty normal, really slow start. And then we didn't do anything in the second half. We got we got the 10 points on, on two back-to-back drives, and that was it. And then we were done. We scored zero points in the second quarter, zero points in the fourth quarter. So, I mean... We're not even a good second half team right now. So yeah, we we do need to get off to a faster start. I mean, three points against the Raiders, three points against the Lions, um, zero points against the Saints, and six points against the Bears is all we've done. That's so that's six, mm, seventy nine, ten, eleven, twelve, twelve points total. Twelve total points through four games. Oh, I don't have the Falcons game here. Falcons game was. Um, yeah, 14 points in the second half. So even that is below the, the state. So we had 10 points in this game. So that was our best half, and we scored zero points in the first quarter. So we we, we sucked through the first half. I mean, and if you talk first quarter, my goodness. 7-0-0-3-1. Um, zero, zero, three, three. I guess second quarter is even worse. But I yeah, I... I Again, we can't even ask the question, like, why are we getting off to a slow start anymore? Because it's not even a slow start. I mean, slow start is certainly a problem, but it's bigger than that. Now now it's just a slow offense. We don't have first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter. We got nothing. We don't have anything in this entire game. They start slow, they stay slow. And again, not having a run game hurts things. The pass blocking has devolved the last two weeks. So now that causes some serious concerns because you can't run and the passing is becoming a problem. And Jordan is unraveling now that there's pressure so we can't pass we can't run what the heck are we gonna do i don't know but we we, we got to figure stuff out and it starts up front the offensive line has got to block better you have to be able to run block better than you have been you got to pass block better than you have been and jordan needs to suck it up and stand in the pocket and throw passes to open guys and then those guys need to catch the freaking ball and if we can't do those things i i, I first of all don't want to hear any more about matt lafleur if we can't run block our running backs don't know how to run we can't pass block. Our quarterback doesn't know who to throw to, can't throw accurate passes, and our receivers can't catch. The last thing in the world I want to hear about is the freaking coach. But yeah, if we could just do those things, you know, 
block, run, pass, catch. Because th- those are the things we're struggling with right now. But once we get those down, you know, that then we're good. Everything else is fine, though. Aside from the blocking, the running, the passing, and the catching, we're good. Anyways, let's take our first break, and uh, we'll come on back and see what else we got going on. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. Why take one vacation with the family when you could take all of them? With Royal Caribbean, you don't just go to the beach. You visit a private island and race down the tallest water slide in North America. You don't just go for a road trip. You ATV and zip line through the jungle. You don't just go somewhere new. You rappel down waterfalls and discover ancient temples. Because this isn't just any vacation. This is all the vacations. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry, Bahamas. Hey there. Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Survivor 46 is here and so is On Fire, the only official Survivor podcast. And we have a twist this season. The winner of Survivor 45, D. Vyadaris, will be joining us every week. We're going behind the scenes of the biggest moments, the how and the why things happen, and the strategy and analysis you can only get from someone like me, a Survivor winner. Listen to On Fire, the official Survivor podcast, wherever you get your podcast. Hey, Ryan. It's a- Aaron calling from Eau Claire, up? Wisconsin, and... Um, Calling once again just about the game on Monday. Uh, I was watching a couple of uh, highlight reels from the game, which uh, I slowed down on the YouTube app and was kind of just watching some of the plays where the Packers' defense and offense were kind of breaking down. Okay. And um, I, I don't really know that much about the play designs and stuff. Um, other than the basics, you know, I, but, but I, I'm not really somebody who's altogether that, uh, good at kind of picking apart what happened and what went wrong. But I was wondering what you think about this because, um, what I did notice was that it seemed like for the Packers defense on the plays that kind of broke down, it seemed like there would be just this wide open space at, in one part of the field and a bunch of players kind of bunching up into other parts of the field. And so, for example, like Josh Jacobs uh, breaks off a end around for a first down for like 15 yards and all the defensive players are collapsing the pocket inside while Josh Jacobs runs out to the left and there's just nobody there until about a yard past the first down marker. Um, I guess then when I watch other teams' defense play the Packers, it seems like there's always somebody in all the the passing lane. They're anticipating it, sure. And very scarcely is there a kind of a an easy play. Yep. And, and so, to me, I guess it looks a little bit like an amorphous. Uh, sometimes it looks kind of like an amorphous configuration of players um, as they try to defend. Another play where there was uh, tight end who got the ball from Jimmy Garoppolo for a first down 
there was three defensive backs, or I don't know if they were defensive backs and linebackers or, or what who they were, but anyways, there's three Packers defenders basically forming a little shell around this area that the tight end went. It was completely open, and Jimmy Garoppolo just dunked it right into him for a first down, and it seemed like... Got cut off. Um, let me just interject here before we get to the second part, because he did call back. So, it's hard to know specifically. I mean, this is this is sort of the, the debate about, is it the player's fault or is it Joe Barry's fault? Um, it seems as though it's easy to manipulate our defense sometimes. Because, uh, again, we, we ran a similar play. I think I know what you're talking about. I remember that because I even commented it on, on, on the podcast. We ran it to Christian Watson, and he got blown up in the backfield. Now, yes, that's partly due, due to blocking, but it's also partly due to a defense that immediately at the snap was sprinting in that direction. All right, they, they were anticipating it. Our defense sold out real hard on the run up the middle. Now, either that is, I mean, th- there's a couple different ways that you can look at it. Number one is our defensive players are not doing the right things, right? In other words, they should be smart enough to identify that maybe it's not a run up the middle, et cetera, et cetera. The second way you can look at it is this is what they're being coached to do. The way that they're being coached to play in these situations and all these kinds of things, slash how they were told to play this specific play. I don't know how specific they get um, in their play calling or whatever. Maybe Joe Barry called a play that is to essentially crash down on, on the middle and that just got manipulated, which would go to, again, sort of the rock, paper, scissors thing where everybody kind of knows what Joe's running and they know how to beat it and they know what they know what it, he's predictable, basically. I guess that's kind of two and three kind of combined there. So one is the, the, the players are just not smart enough or, or doing the right thing. Number two is the way that they're being coached to play. In other words, yes, they should have read it differently, but they were being coached to do that. And number three is play calling. It was a just the right call at the right time against our defense, which t- tends to happen a lot. I don't know which one it was. Maybe Joe Barry's up there screaming, I freaking told these guys to watch for that and they don't listen. Not only was it a good play call, but I, I had coached them specifically to watch for those things and they didn't. I don't know, because I don't know what the play call was, and I don't know how they were being coached. But yeah, I mean, I mean, here's the thing. Every defensive play call has an offensive play call that's going to beat it. And so, if you consistently see guys open, there's a question of, are our guys consistently doing things wrong, or are they just consistently in those vacated areas? And if they're consistently in those vacated areas, it seems to me that we just have a very predictable defense, and they know how to pick it apart. Now, I didn't go back and watch the defense, so I don't have strong opinions on that. I have a general belief that I that I think offenses kind of have Joe Barry figured out a little bit. I understand there are issues with the defensive players. Um, there are all kinds of issues from miss miss tackles to losing, you know, blocking assignment, all 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 kinds of stuff. But I think all defenses do. There's still a larger question of are we doing the best we can with within the the scheme, the play calling, the coaching, everything else, which is a, a much more difficult question to answer. But I, I guess that's the way I would approach this issue. Again, I, I keep using the rock, paper, scissors thing. If, if they're calling the right offensive play at the right time consistently, then it seems to me that, that teams just kind of have our DC figured out. But let's get to the second part of the call here. Okay. Uh, sorry, I got cut off. Uh, it seemed like there were three players completely around him, but none of them really stepped up to preempt the play or right. stepped up to challenge it. And again, that's one word. Do you look at that and say, what the heck are you guys doing? Why don't you go get them? Or is that they're kind of doing, you know, because if you think about it as zone, you would have to sort of vacate where you're supposed to be to go make a play. Somebody should do that. But are they supposed to do that? Are, you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know. Because sometimes you, you bite up. And you leave your area, and then somebody comes around behind you, kind of thing. So, I, and again, I don't know specifically the play and and how all that works. I'm kind of going based off of my imagination, based on what you're describing. But that's where the nuance gets real tough. And and you know, people that understand schematically how these things work generally will have a better idea of you know responsibilities, who's supposed to do what in different situations or whatever. But um, again, that's where these things get real nuanced and complicated in terms of uh, understanding assignments and blame and all that kind of stuff. And I'm wondering what the reason for that is. Is that the design of the right. defense? That's the question. That's the bend, don't break thing? Or is it three players who all have a chance to break up the play and they're all assuming the other player 
is going to jump up and do it, and then nobody does it. Um, it I, I don't really know. Obviously, it's hard to tell. Yeah, and my guess, and that's and, and situationally depends too. Like if it's first and ten, and we're kind of playing, you know, you got those guys in the middle playing zone, you, you three guys or whatever. You mentioned like a shell kind of somebody runs a quick curl route or something. Usually in those situations, and as annoying as it is to us, we're almost sort of forfeiting. And I think that's kind of how Joe Barry will play. It's it's sort of we'll give you the three. We're not going to give you anything more than that. And it gets more frustrating when you see that and it ends up becoming eight or if it's, you know, third and five and we give up five, you know. Um, so, a- again, the the context, I don't exactly know. And even then, you're still kind of guessing. But I do know that there is, there are situations where you somewhat forfeit that because you're almost baiting them into it. Like, please just throw that so that we can get you to the next down and we'll just rally to them and tackle them kind of thing, and I don't think anybody necessarily likes that, but I think there is some rationale behind it, especially if it's like second and ten, and you're willing to give up five to get them into a third medium or whatever. Um, I do tend to think that that's a thing sometimes, unfortunately. Because we don't know what the play design was supposed to be, and uh, uh, we're, we're not there in the rooms, and we don't have their 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 scheme designs and all that stuff, but it just seems like you know, when Jordan Love's got the ball and he's throwing, even to these bad defenses, a lot of times those defenses are at least, like, kind of filling up the space on the field. Um, Sometimes. I mean, th- there was a lot of stealing yards from the Packers. Um, I think we, we killed them on an out route. Just a quick – I mean, they were, you know, f- 10, 15 yards off, and consistently we would just run these out routes to the right side of the field and steal yards. I mean, sometimes we're stealing, like, 10 yards. We beat them on a couple curl routes the same way where they're kind of playing a little soft and we'd beat them underneath. We beat them with some of the screens occasionally. You know, if they're playing a little bit off, we'll try to beat them with that. So, I mean, there was a good amount in this game of, you know, situationally seeing things and and stealing some yards, uh, manipulating a defense that's maybe soft in certain areas. Um, I So I know what you mean in terms of, like, why does does our defense consistently do this when I don't generally feel like I see that happening um, for us? But um, again, having just gone back and watched the offense, there was a good amount of that. I think the, the frustrating thing was that was really the only thing that was working is when we could kind of, I don't even want to say scheme up, but but steal what the defense is willing to give us. And sometimes it really worked to our benefit. We were taking big chunks, but um, it does happen. And I think it's harder to recognize um, – when it's it, it's easier to remember when it's a negative for your defense and it's not as positive. You know, if you steal five yards like it's a five yard pass, you don't get super excited about it. Whereas, you know, when your defense gives up five yards, it gets to be frustrating. Like, dude, why are you standing so far off? What is wrong with you? So I don't know why that's so common. I don't know why the Raiders were constantly giving us that too. That's just how these defenses operate sometimes. But yeah, anytime you'd see a guy standing off, and I think going forward, if you see that, um, expect there to be like a quick five yard out route and just taking those yards because that's what we did all day in the different parts of the field and, and very scarcely is they're just a big bunch of defenders in one area you know that's why it's so hard to break off a run or a short pass i guess i'm just wondering why there's so many open spaces when there's a lot of defenders just bunching up into that one area so i don't know if you saw the same thing um but uh your insights would be highly valuable in understanding what we were watching on uh, that unfortunate night i appreciate that um i will go back and watch the defense it wasn't necessarily my intention but since there's questions about it um Again, I, I mostly like to watch offensive line, defensive line, because it's much more intuitive. It's easier to tell what they're being asked to do and whether they're doing it or not. You get into coverage or passing, it gets to be a much more complex. With the off- what the offense, generally what I was looking at is, was somebody open? If the answer is yes, then that kind of answers what I needed to know, especially in terms of was it scheme or not. Um, but obviously there's there's much more nuance to it than that. If things do break down, why, who did what, you know, did they run the right route too flat, too, you know, whatever. Um, but I, I will look at it. Also, um, JJ put together a little sheet. Um, I just talked to him. He's already got it built. So 
Um, I'm going to use that as a little test run, so I will actually grade the defensive players as we go. It's always kind of tricky because it's it's hard to kind of give consistent grades because it's not just a matter of like you know was that like a he he built it on a four point scale was that like a a two point play or a one point play but comparing that to you know am I now kind of changing the standard as we go through and now I'm being a little bit more harsh whereas I would have given you know what I mean but it doesn't matter it's it's kind of just for fun I want to go back and go through the defense. I'll probably do the same thing where I'll just go play by play, except I'll be grading it. And then at the end of it, I'll be able to give defensive grades. I'm not sure if I'll go back through the offense or not. Depends how uh, enjoyable this process is, I guess. But I will try to do that. And then uh, assuming I follow through with it, I will probably put the grades up on uh, Patreon and on the uh, Substack, which I haven't, I don't use very much. But for those of you that are on there, I'll be sure to put it on there as well. Uh, Why don't we take one more break and we'll get to uh, Trevor. This episode is brought to you by Hyperice, the leader in advanced warm-up and recovery technology. They have tons of innovative products, like Venom-heated wearables to help soothe sore back muscles, Normatec compression boots to speed up recovery and increase circulation, and Hypervolt massage guns to improve mobility. Loved by athletes like Naomi Osaka and Erling Holland. Try them yourself. Get 10% off your order with the code MOVE at hyperice.com. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda, you never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. Hey, Ryan, I had uh, two things that might be kind of fun to talk about while we got the bye week here. Sure. Um, one, there was a scenario where Jordan Love came in and balled out and got a contract extended um, this year. That's clearly, I don't care what he does the rest of the year. He's not getting a contract extension this year. He's going to have to play so. through next year. Yeah. At least part way through the year, you know, um, no matter what. So that kind of, to me, solidifies our cap a little bit for next year. So I'm wondering with him playing on this current deal, um, what's our cap situation like next year with Rodgers coming off and everything? Like, how much money will we have to theoretically spend? I mean, obviously we want to draft, but um, it'd be nice to be able to sign a few quality free agents sure. on both sides of the ball. I think. Um, and number two, I just has there ever been a rookie tight end class like this? Like it was talked about, hyped up coming into the draft, and who knew if it was going to pan out? But I just don't know what PFF thinks of these rookie tight ends, um, and then what their actual production. In, but I just feel like Sam Laporta last night, I don't know how he's done the rest of these, but Michael Mayer was tearing us up, you know. I think Luke Musgrave has looked pretty good when he's been out there. I don't think we're giving him enough opportunities, personally. Um, but, and I know there's others, so, like, I'm just kind of curious to look at this rookie tight end class. Uh, I know, so far. <laughs> yeah, breaking up at the end, but he was done there anyways. Um <clears throat> So 13 rookies have played so far. Uh, three of them are tight ends. The third highest is third highest graded overall, and the highest graded Packers tight end overall is Ben Sims. He has a uh, 68.9 PFF grade. The two guys that are actually graded out well are Sam Laporta with a 78.1, which makes me sad because that's the guy I wanted and my favorite tight end, blah, blah, blah. Who cares, I guess. And then Will Mallory, but Will Mallory has only had two targets, two receptions, 49 yards. But still, it's a thing. Um, Again, Ben Sims, number three. Then Nate Adkins with a 66 grade. Josh Weil, 62. Luke Musgrave, 59.5. Dalton Kincaid, 56.6. Michael Mayer with a 50.7 grade. Darnell Washington, 46.3. Is another guy I liked who's not doing well. Julian Hill, 46. Schoonman, Luke Schoonmaker, 
43 overall grade. Tucker Craft is the second lowest with a 41.9, and Brenton Strange is the lowest with a 39.9. So kind of sucks a little bit. You got uh, Musgrave is 6th out of 13th. Tucker Craft is 12th out of 13th. Ben Sims is 3rd out of 13th, but I don't really expect him to stay up that high. As far as guys that have actually played a decent amount, it's really just Sam Laporta, Luke Musgrave, and Dalton Kincaid. Those are the only three that really qualify with Luke Musgrave right in the middle. Um, right now, uh, the reception percentage, Kincaid 95%, Sam Laporta 80.6, Luke Musgrave just 78.3. And again, what happens to his stats? What happens to his grades if some of those passes were on him a little bit more? It's not like he gets docked for an inaccurate pass, but he does get positive grades and everything else if it's an accurate pass that he catches and especially if he runs for a touchdown which there were opportunities but it is what it is the porta leads with yards at 289 musgrave with 159 kincaid 118 yards per reception sam laporta 11.6 musgrave 8.8 kincaid 6.9 it's another stat that goes way up if we had more accurate passes deep down the field touchdowns laporta three and zero for musgrave and kincaid Receiving grade, 77.6 for Laporta, 59 for Musgrave, 58 for Kincaid. Um, They do, 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 do pass blocking. Musgrave is the only one with a negative grade. Laporta, 75. Kincaid, 70. Musgrave, 52. Um, Run blocking is more important, so let me check on the run blocking. Basically, none of them are good run blockers, but Laporta is the highest. So he's like the best at everything right now, which freaking just ticks me off. Anyways, Musgrave is the second highest with a 62 grade, Laporta 64. Uh, Tucker Craft is eighth out of 10 that qualify. So that's where we're at. I still have high hopes for Musgrave. Um, Again, I I think if we can get some better connections, I mean, we've kind of given up on shooting down the field for Musgrave because it's not working. We started doing more like wide receiver screen type passes, throwing to him in the flat, which is working. He's able to turn up the field and get some yards and stuff, but obviously that's not what's going to be most beneficial as compared to utilizing him in a way that he is, you know, built for. As far as the salary cap situation, as of right now with no changes, next year the team cap space is $34.3 million, and I think that's a projection. I don't know if we 100% know what the salary cap is going to be. Um, we do have some free agents, though, that may need to get paid. Yash Nyman is somebody that potentially is going to get paid, and considering our tackle situation, I think there's a decent chance he does get paid. How much, I don't know. Keyshawn Nixon potentially getting paid. I did see possibly him getting traded away. Um, we'll see. Uh, whether or not he actually stays is a we'll see. I mean, obviously, we liked him as a kick returner, but he hasn't done anything this year. And, you know, with... Uh, with our corner uh, Stokes coming back, I don't know how valuable he's going to be. Rashawn Gary is going to be the big one. Um, we're obviously going to pay him, and that's going to cost a good chunk of change. There's a decision to be made about Savage and Rudy Ford. Um, I'm assuming Rudy Ford's going to get a relatively low contract and is probably going to stay. So Savage, I don't know. They may pay him a low salary. I mean, again, everybody has a price. You know, fans always just want, I don't like him, he should be gone. Um, But everybody's got a price. I shouldn't say everybody, but most people have a price. And I think he's in that range. And if he's willing to take what the Packers think he's worth, then, you know, he can stay. Uh, Dylan, uh, Eric Wilson, I think is worth talking about as a special teamer and his ability. Josiah DeGuara, probably not going to keep him, which is kind of sad for me, but it is what it is. Um, John Runyon. Caleb Jones, so some guys here, Emmanuel Wilson, not a ton of money, Daniel Whelan, um, but, you know, got to make some decisions, got to pay a little bit of money. Now, with that said, there's also some things that we're probably not going to be paying. One of them is David Bakhtiari. I'm, I'm quite confident in that. There's going to be a $19 million cap hit. But that's going to save us $21.5 million. I, I'm sure that that's going to be... I'm, I'm willing to bet that's more money than what we'd pay all those free agents that want to stay. And that includes Rashawn only because it's going to be a little bit lower, his contract at the beginning. So I, I don't think he's going to be... Maybe not. Let's just say 21 all about cover it. So let's say we break even with no Bakhtiari, but we re-sign all the people that we want. 
So if that's the case, then we're still looking at about $34 million. I don't know that there's going to be a ton else going on. You do have to wonder about Aaron Jones, but even that, it doesn't really make sense to get rid of him next year because it costs way more money to get rid of I mean, it doesn't cost more money. We would save uh, about $5 million, but we'd have to pay... Tw- would you rather pay 17 to have Aaron Jones or 12 and a half to not have him? To me, that's a very simple calculation. He stays in 2024. 2025, probably not. But 2024, I think he stays. So yeah, I, th- I mean, I think we're going to have a decent chunk of money. Um, I think we're going to have some money to, to have some flexibility to be able to do some stuff, re-sign our guys. Um, you know, we'll see what we can do in the draft. Maybe we got to go get a tackle. We shall see. Hey, Ryan. Uh, this is Randy from Scranton. What up? Uh, I just... Uh listening to a bunch of call-ins, and I think I think we all need to take a giant chill pill with the offense. Um, your, uh, one of your uh, call-in shows, um, you said, uh, if you can wave a magic wand to make Jordan Love elite, that's what you do. And uh, I love to wave a magic wand and get everyone 100% healthy. I mean, it just seems like every game, someone goes out with something wrong. And they're just lingering injuries every week. I mean, we haven't had Aaron Jones since week one. And, and Yeah, but I mean, that's really on the offense. I mean, assuming David Bakhtiari is just not on the team anymore, that's really the only injury we had, right? I mean, we had the entire offensive line. We had Jordan Love. We had all of our running backs minus Aaron Jones. We had all of our tight ends and all of our wide receivers back. So... I mean, you're right. I mean, I'd, I'd like to have health, but having one injury, um, you know, I, I think that's we should that should be sustainable. I would say. And I think all summer everyone's been saying Aaron Jones is our offense. It, it has to go. Well, th- and that's the problem. <laughs> I mean, come on. You know, I mean, I, I don't think we can say we need to just relax with the offense. Also, Aaron Jones is the only thing that works on our offense. Those are kind of conflicting statements, in my opinion. Through him. And and, and defenses aren't going to – they don't care if we, uh, if we try to run the ball because they know we can't right now. Well, and I also have a, some concern. I mean, listen, I know week one went well, but even for Aaron Jones, that was, that was an exceptionally good game. Um, he generally doesn't perform at that level. And we got to remember there are games where Aaron Jones gets erased. Uh, and the run blocking is so bad right now. I don't know that Aaron Jones does a ton. He's going to do better than than Dylan and, and Patrick Taylor. There's no doubt in my mind. Is it good enough to overcome everything else? I don't think so. I don't think it's good enough to overcome the run blocking, much less the poor pass blocking, the poor passing, and the inability to catch. I, I I don't I mean it, it, to it, honestly it could have been enough to win that game it was a close enough game that you know you convert a couple first downs or whatever potentially yes but it's still a bad offense even if Aaron Jones is able to make our run game look a little bit more competent it's still a bad offense right now and, and that's due to the, the injuries on the line I, I mean it's... well I mean we're again we're we're healthy I mean, we, we could say we don't have Bakhtiari, but that's that's going to be the situation from now until eternity. I don't think he's ever going to take a snap here again. Could be wrong, but I don't think so. So, I mean, if we have an injured offensive line, we're never going to have an offensive line again because <laughs> it's this is this is our starting offensive line. Rasheed Walker, Elton Jenkins, uh, Josh Myers, John Runyon, Zach Tom. That is our starting five offensive line, and that's who was out there. What was it? Um... The Atlanta game or the, I don't know which one it was, but our the whole left side of our off, our offensive line was was hurt, and yeah. the rest of the pieces, I just some of them just don't seem like they're working. Right. So exactly, I, I think our offensive line is a big issue this year. Right. Um, I think before this previous game against Oakland, we were twenty eighth ranked. Um, running team. So what defense is going to sell on our run game? And A.J. Dillon is, I, I, I don't believe he's the answer anymore. Um, and, and I don't think the Packers do either because they were right. trying, supposedly trying to go for Jonathan Taylor. I agree with that. Um, Christian Watson's been out, hurt. Uh, how yeah, much is he doing in practice? 
you know, we saw last year with Aaron Rodgers when, when Christian Watson came back from injury, it took a long time for them to start getting connected. And, uh, you know, the Jordan Love thing, I, uh, I was watching the Peyton and Eli version of the Monday night game and, um, they made a good point. Um, I think Peyton said, uh, it seems like Jordan Love is going through his progressions way too fast. He's bad. And, and that, that might, yeah. um, make it seem like uh, why he's not throwing to the open guy. He, he might not be letting, letting right. the play develop. Yeah, I think the pressure is, is making him nervous and he's not reacting right, which is unfortunate because I thought that was one of the things he was going to excel at. He seemed very confident and comfortable under pressure, but I think a lot of that confidence came from the fact that he had an offensive line that almost erased all pressure. So he very rarely saw pressure. Now that he's starting to see pressure, it seems like he's not handling it well. And I'm worried that, you know, there are times when there really wasn't pressure and he still was getting happy feet. I'm a little worried that, you know, even if the offensive line improves, is he now, I don't want, I hate to say broken, but in a way, if he's, if he's going to be a little bit unsure and uncomfortable, because I mean, that's, that's, we can't. It, it's not going to work that way. You you have to be able to be comfortable and confident in the pocket. It should. And that might be part due to the line, and right. he might be a little shell-shocked right now. Right, exactly. The pressure. So I, I, I think we need to take a step back this year. Um, and what really made me not get too worked up anymore. Well, we'll, we'll get to the second part of his call, but it, it is funny. I, I've had a couple people um, – uh, Thomas Austin, for example, that have called in, they're like, you know, you're overreacting and then go on to describe everything I've said about <laughs> the offense. Like, I, you didn't, I feel like we're agreeing on everything. Like, the offensive line is bad and Jordan is playing bad as a result and we can't run the ball because A.J. Dillon and the offensive line are not good enough. I, I just, I, I guess we just, we, we're seeing the exact same things just coming to different conclusions where I'm looking at it and saying this offense is really bad. And some people look at it and go, "It's not that bad," or something. I don't. I'm not sure. Sorry, Ryan. I went a little too long there, but I just wanted to make uh, one more point. Sure. Um, with the offense, um, I noticed. I don't know if you noticed this in the Oakland game. I think it was the first quarter. Um, I think it was a third down play. They broke the huddle. Luke Musgrave walked up to the line, turned around. I think he was not having a clue what he was supposed to do on the play. And he tried to yell something to Jordan Love, and I don't think he got an, even an answer or the wrong answer. But I think he, I think that was the play when there was three guys all together on the field. And um, after the play, you saw Matt LaFleur was so pissed. Mm -hmm. And you could see him pointing at Luke Musgrave and yelling at him to come here. And he ran over to him, and Matt LaFleur was, wasn't was laying into him. He was just talking to him, not it's yelling, not, but he was a little trying heated. to get his point across on, I think, what Luke was supposed to be doing. And I think eventually you saw him, he was patting him on the chest, and I think Matt LaFleur calmed down and realized, you know, I, I shouldn't be yelling at the kid. So, I, I mean, right there is the great example of how young – our offense is right now. So I, I think, again, I think we need to take a step back. And Yeah, and, and there is some truth to that, but I, I guess when I look at it and see the issues, it's not a youth issue. I mean, that that was an instance of youth being a problem. But again, even on that play, he had an open guy to throw to. So there was no reason for us to even acknowledge that there was a problem there. And and again, I think he could have thrown it to Luke. You know, Luke wasn't where he was supposed to be, but you can still throw it there, and it's it's probably a completion and I don't know. Um I just I don't see a lot of the issues that I saw being guys not doing the right things. I saw a lot of wide open receivers, I saw bad blocking from veteran offensive linemen. Um I saw Jordan Love who, you know, we we can call him young because it's his first time as a starter, but he's been in this system for a long time, um making a lot of mistakes and um I mean the youth as far as, you know, Watson and Dobbs and Musgrave and those guys, I, I thought they actually all did a fairly good job. There were two plays where there were guys bunched up next to each other. One of them was that play where there were two guys 
The other one I think was also Musgrave and and somebody else, but that was basically like a wide receiver. Or a, it was the running back running into the flat. I think Musgrave was supposed to be blocking, but then he kind of got blocked back into the running back, so it looked bad that there's two guys standing there. Uh, and also, again, Jordan shouldn't have thrown it there to begin with to make it look as bad as it did. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, it, th- there's no doubt that that plays a a part in this. I, I just, if if I wrote down all the issues and what they were, I, I don't think youth accounts for very much of it. I don't. I, I think it's just a, a poorly executed offense by guys that should be better. And it's, it's mostly the veterans, to be honest. I mean, yes, there was some uh boneheaded designs in terms of having tight ends do too much in the blocking although again going back and looking at it i actually thought they did a very good job there were just instances where it didn't work and then of course when you see that it it looks terrible because it's like how could you have a tight end doing that and then you realize they've been doing it all day successfully um but yeah i I, again it's a component but it it shouldn't have to be i'm I'm not going to use it as an excuse because first of all, we we saw this inexperienced offense dominate the Chicago Bears, and they've been getting worse every week. There's there's no reason for regression. And then again, secondly, if, if, if I laid out a hundred different problems, youth and inexperience would account for like two percent of it, maybe three 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 out of a hundred plays. Um, it's just it's not as big of a factor, I don't think. As I, I understand, it's 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 a reason to kind of ignore what's going on and say well we should expect trouble we're seeing trouble so you know it is what it is but i just looking at the actual issues i don't think that those are the biggest issues Uh, just see how this year plays out we got to get guys back um aaron jones we got to get him back um after the bye and uh you know, with him, we'll see. We'll see how the running game goes, and if we can get the running game going, like uh, I know it can, um, that just opens lanes up for uh, our wide receivers. So we'll see how the rest of the season goes. Go pack, go. Talk to you later. Yeah, there's no doubt we're a better team with Aaron Jones. I mean, there's just there's no doubt. I mean, it's it's you. you there, there's so many times you notice that. It's the little things, offensively and defensively. And, and if Aaron Jones can kind of make the difference in, in the little things, you know, not dropping that pass as a running back or, you know, choosing the right hole to run through or getting there a little quicker or just with your timing and your patience and all that. I mean, what, if you're converting a couple more first downs, that can make the difference in a couple more points and, you know, a little bit more momentum. And, you know, I mean, that's, that's, that's the problem. It, it always comes down to the little things. And that's why it gets to be difficult sometimes to get super mad about any one thing because it's, it's a little thing. But it's constantly some form of little thing going wrong that's constantly causing just a complete collapse. It's just one little thing after after the other. So, yeah, we get Jones back. Hopefully we start doing little things right and going in the right direction and get a little bit more momentum. I don't think it's a fix-all. But, again, hopefully, you know, it'll just it'll just give us a little bit more oomph and maybe give jo- Jordan a little bit more confidence. And, and, you know, I mean, the biggest thing really is the offensive line just has to be better pass blocking and run blocking. I think that fixes most of the issues on the offense. Assuming Jordan can kind of slow down, calm down, and, and be confident, I think we're back in business. But, but that's where it starts. I mean, the offensive line has to be better and Jordan has to calm down. But then we're just back to what we were to begin with, where it's, you know, it's a it's a pretty good offense, but we need Jordan to be more accurate. <laughs> so, well, I mean, we'll see, man. I, I don't know. We could come out of this by swinging, and I don't want to get all doom and gloom for two weeks just to have us come out, hang 40, and then just say we wasted an entire two weeks pissing and moaning about something that, that didn't need to be pissed and moaned about. Um, you know, I, I, I think the, the thing that we both agree on, Randy, is we'll see. We got to see how the, the season plays out. That's absolutely true i'm just pointing out where where i think we're at right now i'm i'm not trying to make any sweeping statements about where we're going to be at the end of the year because i don't know or where we're going to be next year it's just a matter of this is where we are these are the issues these are the things that are absolutely not good enough and have to be better and um, we'll see if they can do it we'll see if they get better um again i i just i i i like to call it like i see it i don't like to make excuses and I don't mean for that to come out as doom and gloom and we're doomed and this is never going to get better. If, if that's how it sounds, I apologize. I'm just assessing it as I see it. And if next week everything is better, then we're going to talk about how great things are. 
and and then the negative fans can come in and be like, we need to calm down. They're gonna, you know, whatever. It's just, it is what it is, man. And I hope that happens because this this whole podcasting thing is so much more fun when you're winning. You know, doing the podcast, watching back the games, the calls, you know, coming in are all happy and positive. It's so it's so much. And don't get me wrong, I love a good rant and rave on the podcast, but um, I'm ready for a win. It's been a while. When was the last time we lost three in a row? I'm not going to look it up, but it has to have been a while. I don't know. Anyways, um, I didn't realize we're already at an hour, so I guess we'll leave it at that. You guys have a good rest of your day. I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye. The first taste of rare bourbon you finally got your hands on. That's nice. At Caskers.com, we make this experience easy. Caskers is a one-stop spirit curator with an impressive selection of exclusive sought-after rare and household names in the realm of premium spirits and champagne. Discover the top flavors of the year now by going to Caskers.com and using code WELCOME10 for $10 off your first purchase. Get $10 off your first purchase with code WELCOME10 at Caskers.com.